Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And the news concerning Brexit this morning is that Airbus, one of the country's biggest employers, has announced that it is making plans to leave the United Kingdom in the event of a no-deal Brexit. 14,000 people are employed at its sites in Bristol, Stevenage, Portsmouth and North Wales. But the country says that more than 100,000 supply jobs could also be vulnerable. Tom Williams, the chief operating officer of Airbus Commercial Aircraft, said... In any scenario, Brexit has severe negative consequences for the UK aerospace industry and Airbus in particular. We have sought to highlight our concerns over the past 12 months without success. And we've had this response from Number 10 Downing Street this morning. The government says, we have made significant progress towards agreeing a deep and special partnership with the European Union to ensure trade remains as free and frictionless as possible, including in the aerospace sector. And we're confident of getting a good deal that is mutually beneficial. Given the good progress that we are continuing to make in the negotiations, we do not expect a no-deal scenario to arise. Well, joining me now from outside the Airbus factory in Broughton in North Wales is the Labour MP for the area, uh, Allen and Deeside, Mark Tammy. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Mr Tammy. What do you uh, make of this announcement from Airbus? Well, I'm not uh, surprised at the announcement. Uh, it's a very worrying report. Uh, it's a very brutal report, I think, in what it, what it says. I think is that it said they've been trying for 12 months and they're not getting any real meaningful response from the government. And if a company the size of Airbus and the importance of Airbus can't, what is the hope for the rest of industry? Is it the uncertainty that's the problem or the fact of Brexit, bearing in mind uh, that Airbus is effectively a European company? I think it's I think it's both, but you know we all know that business likes certainty, and what what they want to know is this is a business that's all about the next aircraft, and in order to do that they've got to invest not ten minutes before they start building it, but for years and years before, and they're not going to do that unless they really know what the likely scenario is post Brexit, and we haven't even agreed yet after two years of leave, of, of the referendum what our uh, negotiating position is, let alone what the final outcome will be. And just finally, uh, what can be done about it, in your view? Well, the government needs to listen, and it needs to listen not only to companies the size of Airbus, but to the, all the smaller companies, supplier companies, and the whole of industry. And stop just concentrating on what helps put a sticking plaster over problems for the touring party. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us there. Mark Tammy, the local MP uh, for Airbus uh, in uh, Deeside. Well, here with me in Westminster now are the uh, former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, still, of course, a member of the European Parliament, and uh, Kenneth Clark MP, uh, the veteran uh, Europhile Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister, held just about every top job there except Prime Minister, I think. I've uh, been around a bit, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nigel Farage, how much responsibility, uh, I mean, blame or credit, do you think you deserve personally for the fact that Britain two years ago voted to leave the European Union? Well, I don't think there would have been a referendum if I hadn't done what I'd done. Uh, you know, I was taking a lot of votes off the Conservative Party to begin with. Later on, actually, I was taking more Labour votes, but it was the effect, psychologically, I think, I was having on David Cameron that made him concede to say there would be a referendum. Interestingly, when Cameron did that, uh, he thought the UKIP fox would be shot. And actually, all it did in a way was legitimise the position uh, that we'd been putting out there. So, yeah, in terms of the referendum happening, I, th I think that was a UKIP success. Um, and, of course, I was thrilled two years ago that we won, despite having the whole world against us. I, I have to say, with the anniversary coming up tomorrow of that referendum, uh, I feel 
pretty bitterly disappointed at the way this government's okay, handled well, things. I mean, do you accept that it's his fault? Uh, actually, to start, I, I agree with practically everything he said. I, 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 agree I, I several times publicly acknowledged that Nigel, in a way, is one of the most successful political people of my lifetime because he made it absolutely trans he produced a transformative change uh, in this, you know, the whole relationship of the country with the rest of the world. We're waiting to discover uh, where we're going, and it was very much down to UKIP. He he brought immigration into the argument, which strengthened the a previously uh, Eurosceptic cause. Uh, and he took great advantage of the referendum. I don't take away from him his quite extraordinary triumph. I do disagree uh, with uh, the fact that it was just UKIP caused Cameron to call the referendum. He was more bothered, Cameron, David Cameron was more bothered about party management. Oh. He wanted to shut up uh, well, backbench well, Brexiteers before well, the election. Well, Ken, he, he, UKIP thought, partly. he thought what was going to happen was a flood of defections from Conservative backbenchers to UKIP, and that was the biggest fear that he well, had. We, 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 and we'll there was that. some justification in that. We'll leave that for later, because uh, uh, I, I, I had a long row with him, and it wasn't the explanation he gave me. But I also share could, the disappointment a year on. We're getting yeah. nowhere. Uh, and when the government can agree a policy, when the cabinet has a policy for what it wants to do now, uh, we may, we'll, we'll be clear about what's going to happen. But it, we're making, it, it is disappointing that two years after the referendum, mm. we really have made little progress at all. And the present situation is getting very worrying. We're just a few months to go before we uh, leave the biggest free trade area in the world. I mean, I suspect you're disappointed for different reasons. Uh, I think for mirror image reasons. Right. Uh, I, mean, yeah, they're, 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 I agree with that. I think you and I have <laughs> <never> quite agreed <laughs> in, in, on the basic <laughs> policy. So let's take Airbus. For example, is yep. that the sort of thing that's worrying that's you? That's symptomatic. I mean, <laughs> most, both sides both sides have a habit of leaping on one example. So somebody will announce the investment tomorrow and Brexiteers will say this shows what a triumph it all is. You can't leave the biggest and richest international free trade agreement in the world without damaging your economy. There are lots of other things as well. And manufacturing, international manufacturing, is obviously vulnerable. I mean, everybody starts arguing about in general terms I don't see how you can deny that if you're making the wings in Bristol and then sending them over to, to France, you know, lots of other parts, it's true of cars as well. All the bits of it flow backwards and forwards over an open border, tariff-free with no customs procedures. If you don't keep that, then you'll get, it must be it's just simple. You're worse off than you were, and the future of those manufacturing industries is damaged. All kinds of other areas of the economy. Do you accept as that? Well. I mean, you're responsible for damaging, damaging <laughs> do you know, the Airbus. Do you know, 20 years ago, I heard car manufacturers saying if Britain didn't join the Euro, they may well consider pulling out of Britain. I don't remember They're that. still here. Oh, yes, Nissan, others no, like that. I didn't mean that. So, but that's not. Big, I mean, big this is a reality, though, today. Big businesses. This is not a hypothetical Look, scare. We build the wings in this country. How if they close down production, it would take them at least two years to put that back in place somewhere in France or Germany. Big businesses will always lobby for their interests. Of course they will. I understand that. But what business wants above all, where I will agree with Airbus, is what business wants, they want to know what the cards are they've got to play with. Yeah. And, and one of my objections to the transition period is all that does is delay the uncertainty as to where we're going to finish up. No, they, they, they want a transition period, and because for I mean, well, if, well, if, well, they want if, a permanent if, one. If, if you <laughs> haven't settled what the changes are, they don't want to right. just leave with no, nobody having a clue uh, what, what what happens next. I, I don't know how, Nigel, you explain that a business like Airbus or a business like Nissan is not damaged if you just start introducing delays at the ports, new paperwork, new tariffs, uh, start saying you're going to have different regulations. The idea that that will not affect the smooth flow of components and vehicles okay. yes, for making but, a car, but, but Ken, and it's just but, not but Ken, that is 10% of the UK economy. 10% oh, well, of so our economy. Yeah, you know, and you've got to think about the rest. And also, bear this in mind, only 15% of global GDP well, is the Eurozone. There's a great big world out yeah. there. Let's engage with well, it. Well, 10% of the, of the British economy is quite a lot of the British economy. Yes, it is, but Brexit, but why would you, but, for 10% of your economy, bind the other 90% with well, European rules? I just want the to, point about Brexit is we want to become no, competitive. But I just want to put this point to you, because as I understand it, one of your differences with some of the Conservative Brexiteers is you actually think if there is an economic hit in the short term, it's worth it. 
Well, I don't think there has to be, but let's remember But you what... do think it'd be worth it if there was? The referendum wasn't about economics. The referendum was about, do we want to govern our own country, yes or no? And we chose to govern our own country. That is the fork in the road this government has been told to follow, and at the moment, they're not doing it, and they're basically listening too much to big businesses lobbying on their own behalf. Uh, I, I'm agreeing again. That's what's worrying yeah. you, uh, resenting yeah, it's not uh, too <laughs> hard. The, it, it, the, the referendum was not about economics at all. Yeah. It wasn't mentioned. Uh, there absolutely nobody voted to leave the single market and the customs union because it, it didn't feature in the yeah. debate. Oh, well, it, it was did. invented no, afterwards. No, it did. No, it was did. It, yeah, no, it, it, every major player no, said, it, if we vote to leave, we leave the so, single market. I know, but but if, for example, if, for example, as is being mooted this week, we were to agree. Uh, to a single market on goods and in exchange to have some idea of freedom of movement within the European Union, perhaps for workers. Would that be acceptable to you? A total sellout. Total sellout. We voted to take back control of our borders but would, and we voted... But wouldn't that be having voted, the best of both worlds? No, I, I think actually the worst of both worlds in many ways because we, we, we'd find ourselves still with 100% of our economy bound by European rules unable to reach out into the rest of the world and make our own fresh trade deals. No, that is, we, it's clear, we voted, let's put this word out there, we voted for independence, let's take it. Some of the hardline Tories, as I'm currently disagreeing with in the House of Commons, are, are as far, have the same religious fervour that we're leaving everything to do with Europe. Yeah. So that means that mm. we, you know, it doesn't matter about 10% of the economy only being manufacturing and all that kind of thing, you're just pulling out. That, 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 and it, it, it is rather worrying. I, don't, I just don't yeah. understand what drives this thing. If it's got the word Europe in it, uh, and then. We want to be our own, we want to govern own, our own country. We want to be an independent people. We don't want Mr. Juncker yeah. governing us. Uh, most and a bunch of old, a bunch of old losers in Brussels. Most we Brexite want to be free. Most Brexiteers cannot think of a regulation they want to change. If you ask people to right. cite one, usually yeah. they Tom cite Fisher's one that policy, isn't European. Common agricultural you, policy, uh, uh, working time directive. <laughs> I could go on. Only one device I, working I, time I could go on. Of course, yeah, of course. Of course. Mr. There. Clark, you did accept that uh, <laughs> one of the powerful arguments that uh, Nigel Farage introduced into the Brexit thing was the question of immigration. Yes. And uh, there is, is there not, a widespread public desire to yeah. reduce the level of immigration? Well, there is, and it's been whipped up very much. And uh, one thing I totally agree is I think you'd reassure people, because we're not really racialist and xenophobic in this country, only a minority of people. But, I mean, the you feeling, we, is, the feeling we've lost control is what it, it's us better. I agree with that. And people right. just think somehow we, we should control it better. Uh, we could tighten up on Europeans, but we've already discovered that we actually need... Poles coming here to do skilled jobs that we haven't got, or Romanians coming here as nurses, or people coming here to pick crops. I mean, we're going to have to make endless exceptions, and you just stop people. People don't come here just for benefit, but you make it clear you're going to stop that. The real problem is immigration from outside, which I think we should be liberal about. I'm in favour of asylum. I don't have any slightest hang-up about anybody's ethnicity myself, but I think in the campaign, people, it was Muslims people were worried about. It was the people on the beaches of Libya. They somehow thought Jean Claude Juncker was sending them here and they didn't want them to come here. We got enough already, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, now I don't agree with any of that. Uh, but I do think the total lack of control we have mm. over illegal immigration, which is flowing in on lorries and ships all the time from around the world, uh, and our failure with other Europeans to actually mm. respond to the sudden surge from Africa and the Middle East in any effective way and also civilised and humanitarian way, I would hope, uh, that is a big issue. It's causing half the problems in Western democracies all over the place. It's Mexicans in America, it's yeah, Arabs well, in France, immigration yeah. here, nothing actually to do with our membership of the European Union. I mean, conversely, Nigel Farage, is that why you're disappointed that we haven't, haven't closed uh, borders to the extent... No wonder she needs another 20 billion for the National Health Service. Our population is now rising by half a million people every single year, and three quarters of that is directly down to immigration. What was announced yesterday was that complete free movement from the European Union will go on for a further three years without a single promise as to any checks being put in place after that. And, and frankly, quite how the Conservative Party get away with fighting the last three yeah. elections on manifestos, yeah. promising to right. reduce to tens of thousands a year yeah, well, without silly, ever yeah. meaning it, right. I think it's disgraceful. Do you believe there is a Brexit dividend that could fund the National Health Service? Uh, well, there could be, 
but not if you get not if you stay in a transition period where effectively you go on paying in 10 billion a year at the moment you know this 20 billion yeah. she's talking about now it's not a brexit dividend because we, we, we won't actually have left Kate Clark, do you believe there's a brexit dividend complete nonsense uh, she every now and then, uh, unfortunate my unfortunate prime minister you know i have every sympathy with Theresa. she has to she, well, she this can't, very she, studio she, you called her a bloody difficult it, woman she's a bloody difficult she needs to be more difficult with some of her colleagues <laughs> in the cabinet i think uh, but but she 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 she, she, she can't get anybody in the cabinet to agree on a policy. She gets them to agree on something and they all start going back at it afterwards and saying it's crazy and all that kind of thing. Uh, and every now and again she makes a gesture to one side or the other. Sometimes a gesture to my side, sometimes a gesture to Boris or whoever it is. Uh, and to claim, when it's a very good announcement about money for the NHS is announced, and to start persuade, explaining to the public that taxation is going to have to go up to pay for it. So it's a, it's a desirable policy, it will require selling. She decided to give a cheering up sop uh, to Boris with his memories of his boss and things, so claimed that a Brexit dividend was going to contribute to it. Again, I agree with Nigel. Oh at the moment, the Brexit dividend is, yeah. is a complete illusory. Political you know mythology. the legion about, did you? That was the different campaign. No, I, I thought no, I, I thought the mistake was to use the gross figure. I thought they should have used the net figure, and there would have been less of an argument about it. But look, the fact is, we've agreed to pay another forty billion sterling to the European Union as part of our leaving terms. And the real point here, Ken, you know, you you make the point that she sort of gives a sop to one side or the other. What the country is crying out for is leadership. 70% of people in opinion polls, including a third of those that voted Remain, the message to the government is, will you please just get on with it? I know. Yeah, but the details are not understood by the public. And hundreds of questions, and we, all kinds of things we haven't touched on yet, we haven't even started yeah. on, are going to have to be settled. And the other thing not forget is we have based our political position in the world on being a leading member of the EU that was close to America as well, that's all collapsing, and our whole economy has been based on free trade, trade agreements with the Europeans, and through the EU, trade agreements with lots of countries around the world. Are we, are uh, and, and too few. We must not, for playing around because of you know, fervour about foreigners and European things, actually start damaging that for future generations. And of course, months after the referendum came the American election and the election of uh, President Trump, who described himself at times as Mr. Brexit. You were the <laughs> first politician to see him subsequently. He's coming to the UK soon. Uh, are either of you expecting to see him, to talk to him? Well, I hope so, but it's going to be a very difficult trip, isn't it? Uh, the European Union this week announced that the European Investment Bank will start lending to Iranian companies again. We've got a NATO summit, which promises to be confrontational. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be an easy visit. What would you say to him? Or will you meet him? I, don't, I very much doubt that I shall meet him. I'm sure he'll meet Nigel. Nigel's an old friend of his. Uh, and I think the two of them admire each other's spectacular populist campaigning. I mean, they, they rank with the best in the Western world for sweeping, ordinary, my opinion, common sensible uh, politics of government to one side and putting protest and uh, anti-establishment stuff at the head of things. Uh, if you, you know, he'd meet Boris probably as well. Boris has a lot. He's obviously an admirer of Donald Trump. But it's Trump. funny, Ken. It's happening has, in Italy. Has, has it's happening a, in Hungary. I, I, I it's sweeping the whole of the Western world. It's a very, we want the nation state. The time. I think it's a serious problem. You actually have used it brilliantly but, but, to get the but, British into the present Ken, situation. Do you not see? The do you not see that right across the Western world, what voters are saying I do, I is that they want the nation state to be the essential building block no. through which they make their decisions that that is why there's a new italian government it's as simple as that no it's a, it's the it's the, but that what they're, it's the people that what it's based on is the people who feel they've not shared in this great new prosperity that the establishment the politicians are all comfortable you know i was chancellor in the great normality of the 1990s and they say you know here in my rust belt city uh, I'm not sharing in all this. I'm probably worse off than I was 10 years ago. Dead worried about the prospects for my kids. All these people in London, all these people in Washington, they know what they're talking about. I see pictures of rich businessmen fooling about on their yachts, and I, I hate the lot of them. And, and uh, they're, they're, so what we should have, you we do? Have a, what should a politician do about it? I this? think people like me who believe in liberal economics with a social conscience have got to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, why did we not see this coming? What can we do that gets the broader population on board, feel they belong, they're benefiting to, their futures are secure. But this is sadly, I, this is sadly, I think the EU is part of that. But in America, they had Trump. 
in Italy, they've just thrown all their politicians out to have a lot of clowns. But the European uh, Union has got, given uh, us... Here, it was can, Brexit. Can the European Brexit. Union has given us a form of global corporatism, which does actually um, play yeah. into the hands of the big, giant, multinational businesses, a handful of big banks, and actually, we're not even living in a free market capitalist system that you were part of with Mrs. Thatcher all those years ago. We're living in global corporatism, the big guys win, the small guys lose, and breaking up structures like the European Union is the opportunity to, for me, I believe, to help ordinary people. When I was in the Thatcher government, we were taking the lead on one thing in Europe, the creation of the single market. You, you sound as though you're hostile she rejected to the that. modern globalised economy. It, it is difficult, it is complicated, it's rules-based nowadays, and it's only by sensible free trade and rules agreements with other people that you prosper. I won't go into the politics as well. It's a small world politically. Where it's a Cold War breaking out with Putin. We have violence all over right. our borders. Uh, the immigration crisis is uprooting all our politics. You can't just opt out and say it's simple. It's all Brussels. It's all those bureaucrats' right. fault. We're going back to a distant, simple world where we didn't I think, have I think, I think with you two, I think with you two, no one is going to have the last word. I'm going to have to leave it open. Do come back again. Thank you very much indeed.